Okay, we should start. Thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to my session on uh, microprofile reactive specifications. Uh, my name is Martin Stefanko. I work at Red Hat as senior software engineer now. I work mostly, mostly on uh, middleware technologies like uh, Whitefly, JBoz EAP, and more middleware oriented uh, as Quarkus or Smallrite. I am uh, also a microprofile committer since last year, and I'm a big microservices enthusiast. So if you want to catch me on Twitter, it's Xstefan. What we are going to talk about today is uh, reactive programming or reactive systems in general. So I always like to start this talk with a short history about how we get where we are and why we made the decision that we made to get there. So it all started uh, in 2014 with a document which is called Reactive Manifesto, which is a one-page document available on reactivemanifesto.org which was put together by a group of, I think, five or six independent developers which identified a group of properties that they can only find in a, react, oh, in a modern enterprise scalable, reliable systems. And uh, they just defined them as uh, reactive systems and they put this together out to the internet for people to see and to try to achieve what they think that is useful in modern applications. So they define these reactive systems as systems that have these four properties. We will take them from bottom up. So on the bottom we have message driven, which should really be read as asynchronous message passing. It means that we are not sending messages directly to some precise addresses as we have URLs or something similar. We are sending them to uh, named channels or data pipes. So we are just sending them to some dump pipe and we don't really care about this message anymore. This asynchronicity basically means that we are sending a message to the pipe and we don't really know if it's going to be received or when it's going to be received. There is optionally acknowledgements on the backing side. If you are familiar with any messaging at all, this is not a new idea. Uh, what this in turn gives us, and I switch that, is uh, elasticity and resiliency. Elasticity is basically a way or the ability of your application to scale up and down as on needed basis, basically. So if you have many requests, you will scale up. If the requests decline, you will scale down back again. This uh, directly comes from this name channels idea because if you are sending just to some name channel, you don't really care if there is a load balancer behind it or something similar, how many instances there are, if they are going down and up, you are just sending to some channel and you know that the message will be eventually processed. This directly, uh, fluently turns us into a resiliency, which is ability to handle failures. So if you scale down to zero, you have no services. Usually the pipes are clever enough, for instance, Kafka, to save the messages for you. When the service will come back again, you will start processing them again. And if you take all of these three properties together and you will put them into a system, you will get the most important property, which is responsiveness. And responsiveness is ability of your application to process request in timely manner. It doesn't matter that if it's successful or there is an error. Uh, users just hate if you click something and you need to wait for three, four seconds until something happens. And then they will start doing something similar to this and you are basically denying of, denial of servicing yourself. And then it's a different kind of story for users. So from reactive systems and these properties, we are directly identified that we, this is not something new. The, we are already doing this and people call it reactive programming. So basically that's a programming model in which you are not uh, specifying computation in terms of steps that you are doing one operation after another, but you are rather reacting to some stimuli. And this stimuli can be whatever, user clicks, uh, in uh, Excel spreadsheets, uh, you have that some uh, cell, so you change something in some different cell, and that some cell needs to react to it. So we are already using it in our everyday operations, basically. And what all of these reactive programming models have in common are that they are trying to be non-blocking. Non-blocking in a way not that you are scaling threads per request, but you are not blocking individual computations. So uh, I don't think that I need to say anything more to that. With that reactive programming and non-blocking operations, we came up with something which is called reactive streams. This is an API or a specification which uh, basically defines asynchronous data flows or that named pipes with a non-blocking back pressure. 
And what that means, again, we have these name channels to which we are sending messages, and back pressure is basically if you have publisher and a subscriber, then, uh, or subscriber, consumer, which is consuming messages, uh, consumer can become overwhelmed by the messages. So if you are sending too mes many messages, consumer doesn't need to have a way how to process them. So back pressure is basically a way how the consumer can say to the publisher, please stop now for a moment, I need to finish the processing what I already received, and when I will be ready again, I will tell you and you will continue sending messages again. So as I said, this is really an API which consists of four uh, interfaces, publisher, something which is producing messages, subscriber, something which is consuming, processor is an object which is both uh, publisher and subscriber, so you are consuming from one channel and producing to another. And subscription is basically a class which uh, maps to a link between publisher and subscriber, so it represents the relationship. And since JDK 9, they are actually included in the JDK itself until, under Java Util concurrent flow. So how this actually looks like when you are trying to use this uh, API is that you have a publisher and a subscriber. Subscriber calls subscribe method on a publisher with itself as an instance, and in turn, publisher needs to invoke on subscribe callback on a subscriber with that subscription object which was created. When the subscriber then wants to get some data from the publisher, it will call a request method on the subscription with some number, which uh, represents the number of messages that he is going to uh, receive, or he is able to receive. So this is directly implementing that back pressure that I was talking about. If I am not able to process more than two messages, I can request only one. And then publisher in turn uh, invokes on next callback with individual values from the data pipe or the stream on a subscriber. So the subscriber can actually consume them and do whatever uh, they need to do with them. And this will be repeated as many times as needed or until there are no more, no more values. And in that sense, uh, publisher is required to invoke on complete or on error uh, callback on the subscriber representing that the stream was completed or some error happened and the error is passed. So this is pretty straightforward actually. All of these four interfaces have together, I think, seven methods only. So it's pretty straightforward to implement, but actually it turned out that it's not that easy, and many people think that, uh, think that uh, they shouldn't include it in JDK itself, because they think of the, about it more as a SPI, SPI, not API, so service provider interface. And there is actually a TCK technology compatibility kit for this, around 38 tests, I think. And it's not that easy to get this passing. You need to really think about many edge cases which uh, all of existing implementations really rely on. If you are interested in learning more about this, there is a really interesting talk from uh, DevOps Poland last year where uh, Jacek Kunicki actually tries to implement this. In, I think, 30 or 40 minutes, he is able to do 16 out of 38 tests, and he is not even trying to get past that. So, we have these four interfaces of reactive streams, but it's only a basic publisher-subscriber model, so we are just consuming values, basically. Usually, if you are using JDK 8 streams, you, are, you do want to do some operations on them. So you want to map something, filter something, etc. Et these kind of uh, operations. So for that reason, a set of libraries was created which are commonly called reactive extensions. And the most uh, popular ones are Eric Java or Eric whatever language the Eric extensions is available for, and Project Reactor, which is used in Spring. Uh, they are both implementing reactive streams themselves, and uh, this API reactive streams is actually uh, suiting as a bridge between different implementations. So you can create publisher with Reactor with Flux, for instance, and consume it in uh, Eric Java. And here is exactly where MicroProfile comes in. Uh, are you familiar with MicroProfile? Everyone is, great. So this is what we are going to talk about today. MicroProfile Reactive. 
uh, microprofile reactive is in fact two separate specification right now. The first one is microprofile reactive streams operators, which is a single a class reactive streams, which suits as a builder for reactive streams, and a set of operators like that map, flat map, etc. The other one is called microprofile reactive messaging which is the main specification for which we created microprofile reactive specification and it provides a mapping of the reactive streams into a CDI model. So you are able to create CDI beans and define with a bunch of specifications, two, specif uh, two annotations, pardon, uh, the processing of reactive streams. So you are not touching the API directly. You are just saying that you want to consume or produce messages. And with that, I will get to my first demo. Hopefully, if everything works. Please bear with me if I will make some mistakes and feel free to shout at me if you see what the error is. So, for my demos today, I will be using Quarkus. Uh, Quarkus is a runtime from Red Hat. There are several talks on it, on this <coughs> conference. If you haven't heard about it yet, oh. I was too fast and I forgot to delete it. <coughs> yes, I was trying this home. <laughs> so, if you haven't heard about this before, definitely check it out, quarkus.io, really fast, based on GraalVM, you are able to compile to native, and what I like the most is actually, yeah, I have it already open, is actually this, and that's, uh, Quarkus dev mode or live reload mode. So if I now start Quarkus is this live reload mode, is it big, big enough for everybody? Great. I can now go into my service, which I have here, and just open something, which will, is usually generated for you, but my custom script get, get is going for me. So I have a single JAXRS resource slash ping, which is returning hello, so I can actually come on where I am. Try it out here. And I will get back hello. What that live reload is, is that I can go into my IDE, just say here, devconf, save it, go back to my application. I haven't stopped it, nothing, just repeat the same call and changes a directory compiled. This is something very powerful and Nowadays when I'm trying to show something or try something like really little code, this is actually faster for me than to compile a main class. So if you want to use uh, basically anything with Quarkus, you need to add it as an extension. And there is a command in Maven Quarkus plugin which is called uh, list extensions, which will give you back a list of all extensions that are currently available. These are being updated on basically monthly basis, communities always building new projects into Quarkus. And this is mainly because there are some kind of uh, hacks that you need to do if you want to compile your applications to native, and usually these uh, extensions are doing this for you, so you don't need to do it yourself. So I was telling that I am going to use reactive streams operators. Here is a command that I can just copy Really, pretty easy. I will just copy paste this. I will find the extension that, that I want. Copy the oh, copy the come on. Yeah, I must copy the extension. Let's say, <laughs> and hopefully I have it there. Yeah, I will just provide it in a single command, run it, and it should like install the extension. But really, what it does, it will add a new Maven dependency. <laughs> but I can do it in fancy way. So uh, now we can start actually working with reactive streams operators and for that I will create a new uh, resource. I will call it just RS1. Let's say and we will do void RS1. And here, oh yeah, won't be, I, I told you that uh, basically what the reactive streams operators are all about is single class which is called reactive streams. And on these reactive streams is actually a builder. We will be using that builder, but for now we just want to create a custom data flow with only a few values, so I will just create a few values here. I'm a big Star Wars fan, so sorry. And then you have already these uh, operations that you are usually using on streams, so I can map something on, the, on there. 
or maybe two uppercase, I can filter only ones that are starting with L, and then I can push them directly to a Reactive Streams subscriber or to something which is coming also from Reactive Streams, but we don't need to take care about that now. But you can also collect them directly to a list, and this is what I'm going to use right now. Sorry? Releases. Ah, yes, thank you. Uh, so basically, now we have something which is called a competition runner, and you need to run it yourself. This is not something that you are going to use when you are developing with that next specification, because this is somewhere inside of that framework that is providing you the implementation that will run it for you. So hopefully if I type everything right, yeah, I have already a new terminal here, and I now invoke that RS1, my application is recompiled, and I didn't print anything, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so this will return a completion stage, and we can just do then accept this time, I'll run it. If I now run it again, it will again re uh, recompile and we get our result back. This is nothing fancy, but it is already a way how to deal with reactive streams, and we will use it later. So one more example that I want to show you is actually how to use that uh, reactive streams with reactive streams operators. So I will do just RS2. And here we again do reactive streams, but now we will use method from publisher, which will take a publisher, reactive streams publisher. Then we will push it through a processor, reactive streams processor, and in the end we will. Yeah, it doesn't work like this. We will push it to subscriber. I just need to quite help idea. We will push it to subscriber. And yet, of course, in the end, we need to run it. But idea doesn't play with me now. So let's create publisher, processor, and subscriber really in a fast way. So this will be publisher of, let's say, long. And as I was saying, there are multiple. Oh, come on. Import class, yes. Thank you. Uh, there are m multiple implementation of reactive streams, and actually the implementation that we are using <coughs> in Corpus, which is called small array reactive messaging, comes with RxJava dependency, so I can use flowable right here, right here and just do interval in every half a second. And that's everything that I need to do. I already have a publisher which will be uh, producing values every half a second. I will just limit it to 10 values because then it would be go going forever. For a processor, this is a little bit more complicated. We need to specify two values, the ones that we are consuming, which will be long, and we will be producing strings. And now we again start with the reactive streams, but this time I will use a builder directly. And I want to use here, for instance, map. Here is Java a little bit shorter on uh, Java type system. So it thinks that it's an object if you don't help it and say that I actually know that this will be long. And now they should give me uh, long and let's just do this long plus iteration. And let's just also map it to uppercase. Oh, sorry, to uppercase. And then all we need to do is just build RS. And that, that uh, reactive streams already know that this is uh, processor and it will build a processor for you. There are a lot of over overloadings of these methods inside of the, uh, the Reactive Streams class. You can check it online in the documentation. So the last thing that we need to take care of is the subscriber. And this will be actually subscriber of string, not something that extends things. And here I do that something that I told you not to do, so don't try this at home. Because I will implement the subscriber myself. And uh, yeah, I will write just the basic subscriber, which will definitely not work in any normal use case, but for demo purposes, it's enough. So first thing that we need to do, we need to save that subscription. If I can write it right, subscription, okay. And this will be S. 
So we have now our subscription if we subscribe to any streams and then we need to use that subscription to actually request some data. I will only request one value. This on next callback will be invoked for every uh, value that is going to be produced for our, from our producer. So I will just see out the value and I need to again request another value because otherwise nothing happens. On error, I will again print only error, and on completion, I will just print that we completed. And with that, if I close this, we should be able to compile, and I, if I type everything right, uh, sorry, we should see something now, hopefully. And we see that our subscriber is now consuming every half a second our transfer uh, annotation, so we created reactive streams on the fly. So okay, with that, I will close this and we'll go back to slides for a little while. If there are any questions, please ask as I'm going or say them into an end. I don't really, it doesn't really matter. So the other and the main specification of reactive is the reactive messaging and that, that CDI model that I was talking about. So in your application, if you are Java Enterprise developer, you probably know what the CDI bean is. Nowadays, uh, MicroProfile is really based on CDI model, so uh, we encourage people actually to put everything into beans and to use it in that way. So in a microprofile reactive messaging, we expect that the stream is created in some CDI bean, then it's passed to a different bean, which can, for instance, map it to something, map it again to something else, filter something, and in the end you just consume it somehow, bring it into a console or something else, or you will push it somewhere else. So there are actually a motion or how you can connect your streams to uh, different systems, and this is called connectors. Basically, a connector is uh, a plugin or extension that you can put into your application. We take that the application is that gray rectangle. We have several beans. In that beans, you are doing your own processing. You are sending the flows as you like, but you will use connector on the edge of the service or on your. Uh, API of your service to actually connect to a different system. And this is something that is provided for you by the implementation. So you can, for instance, say just, I want to consume this stream from a Kafka. You will just say somewhere that you want to use Kafka connector. And basically, the stream will be filled for you from the Kafka transform, and you can consume it in your CDI bean. Again, put it through the chain of CDI beans as you like, or you don't even need to put it only in one bean. And again, on the other side, you can pl plug a different connector which is connected to something else. Of course, these values can be produced by users themselves. So you will just transform the, you will push basically the messages from users to a new stream. Similarly, as I did with the follow-up. What reactive messaging is really from a user perspective are currently two annotations. There will be three soon. The first one is outgoing, which is just taking the name of the channel to which you are producing messages. And the second one is incoming, again, name of the channel from which you are consuming messages. If you combine both of them, you are creating basically reactive streams processor. You are consuming from one stream and pushing values to another. And with that, I will get to my last demo, which, uh, in which we will be trying to rewrite and HTTP uh, microservices deployment to use reactive messaging. So what we will start with is this architecture. So we have our users which can request a coffee through HTTP on our front end coffee shop. And coffee shop in turn with again, currently HTTP asks the barista service to prepare the coffee. There is a random sleep time in the barista which simulates the preparation of the coffee. And when this is finished, you will get the chain back to the coffee shop and the coffee shop will pass the information that the coffee is prepared to the user. So you would say that this is how we usually order coffee and people are happy about it, but usually they are not because if you order the coffee, you need to wait for the duration of the whole chain until it's finished with that random sleep time. And un un uh, until it is finished, you are not able to do anything. You are just waiting, blocking the thread. So when... Uh, when, for instance, uh, even the barista service fails because of network or something similar, or uh, you are not able to uh, contact it, 
what do you do? You will just try, the coffee shop will again try to contact the barista service, but the service is down, so you will just propagate the error back to the users. And what will user do with the error? Again, nothing. This is usually how you will order coffee in uh, stands like here. So you will come there, you will pay the money, and you will stand there until you will get the coffee. And you can do other stuff while you are waiting to get your coffee. So what we are going to do is actually to reply to asynchronous message passing to that reactive system. We will still get an HTTP request from our user to our coffee shop front end, but now we will send uh, not an HTTP, we will send messages actually to two queues or actually Kafka topics. One is named queue, the other one is orders. And basically we will directly return a response to a user saying, yes, we got your order and your order will be prepared somewhere in the future. From the queue topic, there is a board service, which we will type in the same service as coffee shop, but for architecture it's better shown this way, which will just be displaying the messages to the user. So we have some like table saying that, yes, your order is in the queue, and when it's finished, the, we will switch it to ready. From orders, we have a, another microservice, which will be, again, barista taking orders and producing beverage-ready messages to the queue. Again, this will be displayed on the board, and the user can read that the coffee is ready from a board and go take it and go away. So this is, if you are a fan of Starbucks, more to the model of Starbucks. You will get a ticket, you will go sit somewhere, do your stuff, and when your coffee is ready, they will shut your name or some variation of your name, and you will come for the coffee. But in the meantime, you are doing whatever else you need to do. So OK, I will try to type it right now. I still have a plenty of time, so hopefully we'll finish it. Uh, I have here already the architecture prepared, so I have here my coffee shop, my barista, and my client. So I will just start the services. Sorry. Compile the... Compile the... And now they are running on the HTTP architecture, so if I will go to localhost 8080, hopefully now it's running, and I will request a new coffee. We see that it's in progress, and when it's finished, hopefully we will get that it's ready. But what I mean by that blocking is when that I click this order, I cannot click it anymore. I can order, one, order only one coffee, coffee per time. So it is actually nicely shown here if I do just HTTP. You, you can see that Sorry, by the duration, when the coffee is prepared, I'm basically blocked. I cannot do anything. When the coffee arrives, I can continue my processing, but I'm blocked for the duration of the preparation of coffee, which is a random time. So let's see what it would take us actually to rewrite this application to use uh, uh, Kafka in the background with reactive messaging. So first thing, which I always forgot, is to actually start the Kafka. And we need to create uh, our topics that we are going to be used be, uh, because we want to distribute them to between different baristas at the same time. So now we should be good to go if the Kafka is running, hopefully. And it is. So we can start by adding actually dependencies into our services because currently they are not there. So what I need to only type here is Maven Quarkus again at extensions and we are adding reactive messaging and we are adding that small right Kafka connector because we want to connect to Kafka. And I need to run this command in for the coffee shop. You see that it was restarted and I need to run it also for the barista. And now the barista is restarted. I can close this, and now we see that the extensions have been installed, and we should be able to now rewrite our service to use Kafka instead of uh, HTTP. So we will start with actually this beverage class, which is representing a JSON, which is being sent to the board resource. I will actually copy the one which is in uh, our coffee shop service, because it has one more field and that's preparation state, which is only in queue or being prepared or ready. And this is necessary for us, uh, this was unnecessary for HTTP because you were just returning the coffee, sorry. But uh, 
right now it's uh, better because now actually the barista will say when the coffee is ready, not the coffee shop service. So I will just copy paste this in here and replace it. All right. So it really just edit uh, this preparation state and edit a new queued uh, static factory, which will just queue it in the, into into another. But we will not even use this, and we need for a JSON B getter, etc. So in our barista resource, we can start to actually start retyping. I will close this. Retyping this Juxares resource to actually, yeah, it will just fix this error because it's just saying that it's now missing uh, the one uh, required parameter. So we are just saying that when the coffee is prepared, then it's in state ready. So this is our Juxares barista resource. Only single post method, which is called on slash barista, it will just sleep for a random time and it will prepare a coffee. So. What we need to do to transform this into uh, reactive messaging, CDIB. Actually, in uh, Quarkus, all JaxRS classes are also CDI beans, but for our use case, I only need to make it a CDI bean. It doesn't need to be a JaxRS resource anymore. And I can just rewrite this annotation post to incoming, which we were talking about, and we will be consuming from a queue orders. And outgoing, sorry, and we will be producing to Q in the same way as we had in, a, in our example of architecture. And I think that's it. This is everything that you need to do to transform an HTTP service to be actually based on reactive messaging. Three lines. OK, there is one more thing that I need to add, and that's a codec, because now, they, now we are going to consume uh, order, which is a JSON in our case from Kafka, and we need to give a hint to small i implementation that this is actually an order for JSONB to be able to deserialize it. And for that, we need to create a single class, which will be in codex package, and it will be uh, order this uh, realizer. This needs to only accept is a JSON B deserializer with order, and we need to give it uh, one constructor order deserializer, which will just call super with the order class. We are working on a way how we can uh, detect this automatically, but right now you need to add this single dummy class to just help the implementation to figure out what JSON B class to deserialize. So this should be it. Only thing that is left is to actually configure the Kafka connector, and for that I need to help myself because this is a bunch of properties that you will never need to remember, and this is why I don't remember them. But I can explain what they are doing. So basically, each microprofile messaging uh, config proper, uh, uh, property is uh, in this uh, type. There is always MP in the beginning, MP messaging, then incoming or outgoing depending on the channel that you want to configure so you ha can have the same name of the channel for incoming and outgoing messages then the name of the channels orders or queue and then there are separate uh, properties that are actually passed uh, for the configuration so we are just saying that for our core orders we are uh, consuming from orders here we have incoming and we want to use uh, connector small right kafka that's one that we added uh, through a command line. From a value deserializer, we, we will use that class that I just created a while back. And here are a few properties for Kafka itself, which uh, just configures it for a, something, uh, one example that I want to use later. And for queue topic, similarly, it's just outgoing now. The name of the channel is Q, and we are going to use Kafka, and we use the default JSON deserialization because we can use it here. So that should be everything that we need to do with uh, actually barista service. The only thing that I need uh, that is left for me to do is to actually restart it because I don't have it. Uh, I have it in dev mode, and for that I need to do an HTTP request. So I will just restart it by calling a help. But this is a side note. Uh, and with that, I think that we can move to our coffee shop service.
and we will start in a coffee shop uh, class. So uh, for now we have two endpoints. One is HTTP that you saw uh, right now, which is just doing a blocking HTTP call. Here we have an async version, which is just returning a competition stage. I will, just to save time, say this is behaves exactly as that HTTP version uh, default JaxRS implementation is, oh, JaxRS implementation, what they do when you return a competition state, they will just uh, substitute the method invocation to a different thread, but you as an external caller, when you are making HTTP call, you are still blocked. It just executes on different thread on the server, so you can do more requests on the server, but you as an end user are still in the same sense HTTP blocked. So I will add here another post method, but this time we will do uh, slash messaging. And we will do here, actually what we will be returning here is order right now, because uh, this will be async. So this will directly return just some value. And we can call this messaging. And we will also consume an order from uh, our user. We will start with actually just setting an order ID and I have a helper method here. And what we need to do now, if we check the, our application, so we are typing now this coffee shop service, we basically need to send two messages to Kafka and the one is to Q, Q and the other one is to topic orders. So let's just do that. Since this is inside of the method, and this is basically bridging of uh, imperative and reactive world, because the invocation of this post method will be still done in a blocking way, normal HTTP call. But now I want to switch to a reactive stream to create a flow. And for that, uh, we are actually having an option to inject directly from an implementation a channel like this, yeah, we need to provide it a name, and this channel will be, first one will be Q, and what we will add, uh, inject here is actually an emitter class, which as you can see is currently coming from small right itself, but right now is there is an open PR, how we will move it to the spec, because it's very useful. We just need to say it, what we will be emitting, and what we will be emitting to our Q, that's beverage, and we will call it Q. And we also need to, sorry, inject the channel uh, orders. And this will be also be emitter, but this time we will be saving orders. And this will be the topic that is consumed by our barista service. And let's call it orders. Yeah, sorry. So to actually send a message on an emitter, it's pretty easy because there is a send method. We just need to send there a beverage. And for uh, this case, we have directly that static factory, which will just create an object which is queued based on the order. And to our orders, we will just send the order. And we will return the order now with ID. So we will really just send two messages and we will return back to the user. So the user will get back a confirmation that the order was created and sometime in the future, he or she will find it on the board that it's prepared. So that should be everything that we need to do here. So let's now actually create the board resource because right now we don't have an access from this front end uh, to our application. So I will create uh, a new JaxRS resource which will be actually, let's call it dashboard and board service, or board resource will be better. And this will be actually only a uh, JaxRS resource that will be consumed by a WebSocket in our front end. So we have like live reload in the front end. What I need to do here is again to eject that channel, but this time we are going to consume from that queue. And for that we are also going to use the channel. We can call it whatever we like. So we can, for instance, say here the bridges, if I type it correctly. Uh, but this time we will be consuming. This is slightly confusing. If we are consuming, we are injecting a publisher because we are actually going to publish from this queue to the front end. But yeah, this is the way it needs to be done. And we can just consume here directly the string. Even if I know that it is going to be a JSON in there, I would need to serialize it back to a string. Nevertheless, when I'm sending it through a WebSocket. And I can call it queue. Like, 
because I know that it's actually called Q. Uh, here we need to just single get with produ which produces uh, media type Java score, servers and events. So if you are not familiar with servers and events, really useful stuff, I don't have time to go into that. And we will just return here our publisher, get queue, and we will return the queue. And that should be everything that it needs to be done, I think, hopefully. <laughs> Again, the last thing that we, it's left for us to do is, again, to put a bunch of properties in our application co configuration. Sorry, I need to copy all of them. But I will go again through all of them. What we have already here, Quarkus HTTP port, default port that the Quarkus application is going to run on in our uh, barista service. Come on. We have 8081, so they don't conflict. This one is actually coming from a different microprofile specification, which is called REST Client, and it's uh, basically what we are using uh, to call the Barista service through HTTP. So this is, again, a different microprofile specification. It's just an easier way how to structure your outgoing JAX REST calls. And now we can get into our microprofile uh, messaging calls. So again, the same structure, MP messaging, outgoing, incoming. So if we have orders which is outgoing, because in our coffee shop service, we are actually emitting values to our orders. We need to say outgoing, the name of the channel which is order. Again, we are sending to Kafka, and we are serializing with the default, default JSONB serializer. And for our queue, uh, we are also using Kafka. This is the same one that uh, is injected here. We are also using Kafka, also using JSONB serializer, and we are just saying to Kafka that we want to broadcast this value. And the last one that is going to be configured is this one, which is actually incoming because we are consuming beverages from the Kafka queue. So we need to say incoming, the name of the channel, this needs to match uh, this string, which is passed to the channel or to the incoming or outgoing annotation, and then connecting to Kafka, the topic name in this case is not the same as the channel name, so we need to specify that it's a queue and again a bunch of uh, uh, properties for Kafka. Uh, we are just saying here that we want to uh, use a default string deserializer from Kafka. That's really strange colors. And that's it. Like really, this is not something that you would learn uh, by heart. This is available in Quarkus documentation. You can find it on internet. There is a lot of examples, really nice guides. So if you need to configure something, usually you can find how to configure it, not something that I would type here on the place. And with that, I should be now able to call my messaging endpoint, which hopefully restart the application and I will get my copy back right away. And if you will check here the barista service, uh, you will see that the coffee is prepared in a length of time. So I am already finished here. And the coffee is, yeah, it's, it's a random time. So unfortunately, I need to try it several times. You see that I can do other stuff. I'm not blocked. And when the coffee is prepared, the message is pushed back to the queue. So if I show you this in a front end, I will just refresh the front end. And we will switch to messaging. And I do here some order, we see that it's in queue and it's ready. But this time I can do several orders, as many as I want. And they will be all pushed to that queues. And eventually when the barista is ready, it can uh, pull the order from the queue, prepare the coffee, push the new message to the topic queue, and this will be displayed in our frontend service. So what this allows us to do actually is uh, to directly get that uh, properties from the reactive systems that I was talking about. Because now we are having these name channels and we are pushing messages somewhere. Sorry. So if there are multiple messages in a, in a queue, like you just see, so uh, and the barista service dies, what will happen? So I can go actually and kill the barista for a while. And now I will go back to my front-end service and I will actually make a few orders. Now we can wait for a while, but nothing will happen because there is no barista to actually process these requests. So when the barista will come back from break, he or she will see, because there is a random name generation, that there are some, uh, so it's a he, it's a George, 
you will see that uh, there are some orders which are not prepared in a queue, start pulling from a queue and finish all the orders, hopefully. Again, uh, thank you. So this would be that resiliency. If we have, yeah, if, it, if it comes back again, it will just start pulling messages again from a queue. If we have too many orders, so we need to take another body style, we need that elasticity, we need to scale up, they will just start taking messages from a queue on as needed basis. If the second one is finished sooner, it will just pull the, another message. And for that, I will actually stop this one and open another one. And I will start, uh, I will package this application because it's easier this way. So just a little while. If I now start this application manually, make this bigger and start this application on the other port 8082. Now we should have two baristas ready to process messages and if we go to our front-end application and I will place a new orders in a queue, hopefully there will be two different baristas taking the orders from the queue. And all I need to do is basically three lines in a barista to change it from blocking HTTP to actually be using Kafka in the background and a bunch of configuration, of course. So that would be everything that I had prepared from the coding dem demonstrations. Again, when, you, when the number of orders decrease, we just kill one of the barista services, we will scale back down. Usually you are not doing this in a terminal like I am right now. You have it, this in a Kubernetes, you will just be sending some commands, scale up, scale down. So if you find this interesting, this is the dependency for MicroProfile Reactive Stream Operators, currently in version 1.1, on one, and this is MicroProfile Reactive Messaging. This is only the API. MicroProfile itself are specifications, API. So if you want to use this somewhere, there is currently SmallRai as an available application, and Livevent has something. So SmallRai Reactive Messaging and Reactive Operators, and that should be everything that you need. So thank you for your attention. I hope that you like what you saw, and if there are any questions, I can take them now. What's the implementation uh, uh, of, uh, like, is this based on Netty or something, uh, this Mario, right? Vertex. 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 What was Vertex. Vertex. Ah, that's Vertex. Yeah, at least in small rank. Uh, can you take care of how this is? Send a message, the message passed with a whole form of application or something. Uh, can you take care of it in another uh, stream or something else? So how, how is that working? Yeah, uh, well, basically that's exactly what I did because uh, you will get back whatever the message is that you're consuming. If it's Kafka, it's a string. I parse it with JSONB back to an object. I can map it to something, change some values, and I can just uh, again, serialize it to some different channel in different form. So exactly what I was doing manually with the reactive stream, the publisher and processor, you can do it with that annotation incoming and outgoing. If I will have incoming outgoing to, from string to long, and you will do the transformation in the method, that method will be invoked for every value that is going to be produced in that incoming channel. And you will produce one value to that outgoing channel. So in that way, you can change it in any way you like. But if you are using the connectors, to Kafka, IMQP, etc. You need to take care, you need to tell basically the Kafka or the smaller implementation that this is actually a JSON object. This is why I needed to add that the serializer myself. But it isn't hard, but it's unnecessary. So we are trying to figure out how we can directly from structure of the code take this information. You will just say somewhere that you want to use JSON B and it will switch everything automatically for you. Like JSON, uh, Jack Sarez is doing already. So hopefully that answers it. Are those extensions for Quarkus or small right extensions for Quarkus GA or they are uh, not ready? Quarkus, yes, they are already GA. Quarkus is already. I was using one that O final. Yeah, but those extensions. I'm yes. talking about those reactive extensions. Yes, they are, they are they already are also supported. I wouldn't say su supported as, because Quarkus is still a uh, community version. We are working on creating a product, and in that product, they should be supported. And the product should be out in several months. And the, 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 there are reactive drivers for the 
databases are also GA now? I don't know that, sorry. But if you ask on Quarkus mailing list, that should be the best place to ask. Anything else? If not, thank you for your attention.